What if you could map the path from memorization to genius? What if there is a roadmap that showed exactly how thinking evolves from basic recall to groundbreaking innovation? If there were such a thing, it would look an awful like Bloom's taxonomy. As an instructional designer and as an educator, I've joked about getting Bloom's taxonomy tattooed on my body because that's how much I use it. You'll notice, looking at this pyramid here, it describes how learning basically works. It's a taxonomy. It starts at the bottom, remember, very broad, basic memorization, up to understanding, all the way up to the top to create where someone's producing new or original work. Let's talk a little bit more about what this taxonomy is, where it came from, how it's evolved, and how you might use it to structure a learning experience. First off, let's talk about Bloom. He puts the Blooms in Bloom's taxonomy. He is Benjamin Bloom. He was an American educational psychologist. He was really big on studying how learning is mastered. So not just how people learn, but how we go from one level to a higher level to actually master whatever it is at hand. And he led the classification of educational objectives, I've got a typo on screen there, forgive me, from basic all the way up to high level. Now, he led a group in 1956 that came up with the original Bloom's taxonomy. It starts with knowledge down here at the bottom and goes up to evaluation. You'll notice that this version has nouns on it. Now the structure has stayed the same over time. It's a hierarchy of learning. The taxonomy posits that there's basic stuff you need to know in order to be able to comprehend, apply, analyze it, synthesize it, and ultimately do some evaluation with it, right? Um, this has been used ever since 1956 to design full learning experiences, curriculum assessments from start to finish. It's always helped educators match what they want their students to learn to those outcomes and help them choose teaching strategies to help them get their students there. In 2001, this taxonomy was completely revamped. So sometimes you'll see references to Bloom's taxonomy. Sometimes you'll see it called Bloom's revised taxonomy or revised Bloom's taxonomy. In any case, where we're at these days is you're looking for the version that uses the verbs instead of the nouns, okay? So we're really always looking at learning as a behavior or as an action, something observable. I always beat this horse to death when teaching learning objectives. When we are measuring what students are learning, we're measuring what they're able to do. We can't measure knowledge, but we can measure whether a student is able to remember something because they can define, they can recall, they can describe all those things. This is a black box. So someone has to be able to do something with or using that knowledge or that skill in order for us to measure whether or not they've actually achieved it. So. Bloom's taxonomy comes in. Oftentimes when I'm structuring a learning activity, I'm thinking about what I want the learners to be able to do following the learning activity. A lot of the times I'm teaching introductory classes, so we're starting down here with remember and understand. And then maybe by the end of the class, we'll do something with create. All of this is highly subjective. There's big learning experiences that are an entire semester or an entire degree program. And there's small learning experiences. So it might just be a single webinar or maybe a single tutorial. But in any case, the taxonomy is always the same. You start somewhere lower and you get learners someplace higher, okay? They might come in already knowing the terminology, so you're having them apply, move up from there. It depends on who your learners are, what the subject is, and what experience and knowledge they already have. All right, so let's look at these a little bit more closely here. Again, this is the simpler stuff down below, and you'll notice it's the base of the pyramid. Just like you're building a pyramid, you need to have a solid foundation in what the terminology is. I like to describe the bottom two levels, remember and understand, as being the concepts and the terms and the definitions that are critical to even be able to understand and apply and analyze whatever it is that you're learning. Think science. 
So imagine that you're in a biology class, you're learning about the parts of a cell. You're, you're never gonna learn how that cell works and how it looks works in a larger organism unless you understand and you are able to memorize the parts of a cell, mitochondria, all that good stuff inside of a cell that makes it work together. So then you can understand the relationships between those parts. Does that make sense? So once you learn the parts of a cell, you learn how they work together, right? So learning the parts of a cell might be remember. Uh, understanding how they work together would be understand. Um, applying, you might be able to um, apply your knowledge to be able to fully describe how the cell makes its energy based on other processes that happen. In any case, you go on up from there. Eventually, maybe you'll end up doing a postdoctorate and you're creating something, or maybe in the class itself, you're just gonna do a final project that imagines something about the part of a cell and how a cell might work in a larger thing. In any case, all subjective, but you do have to understand and remember basic information in order to do something with information and be able to um, apply it and do creation with it later on. Another example is you might be sitting in on a physics class, an advanced physics class. If you haven't taken beginning physics or intro to physics, you're not gonna understand a single word that is said in there because you missed that foundation. A lot of subjects are like that. It's like when you don't understand what's going on, it's because you don't have the basic vocabulary to even talk about it sometimes. All right. As part of that 2001 remodel, they also created this kind of more three-dimensional version of Bloom's taxonomy. You don't see this one used quite as much as a basic pyramid because the pyramid is very just like, oh, that makes sense. I can apply that right away. But this one makes you think a little bit more about the types of knowledge. So you'll recognize these six categories over here. That's on the regular Bloom's taxonomy or Bloom's revised taxonomy, okay? It starts at remember goes up to create. But there's a secondary dimension here that pertains to type of knowledge. So as you're thinking about parts of a cell, how the cell works, all of that, there's factual and then there's metacognitive, all the way up to metacognitive, okay? So factual is the basic stuff, conceptual, maybe how the parts of the cell work together, procedural, maybe how to manipulate a cell, metacognitive, maybe you're thinking about the effects of um, air pollution on cells or something, or maybe your own part in air pollution, how it affects cells. I don't know, metacognitive is thinking about thinking, if you're not familiar with that concept. But you'll see that the the progression here is kind of a similar progression over here. It's a simple to more complex. This is more simple to more complex as well. There's um, different layers of thinking, starting with very basic up to very complex and metacognitive. So some folks like to use this version to help them nail all the different kinds of knowledge within a learning experience. It's just a different way to think about what your learner should be able to do, what they should be able to learn. And as you are constructing your objectives or your larger learning outcomes, you might be wanting to progress through both of these or maybe in a single category, like say remember, maybe you wanna hit all four of these types of knowledge if that makes sense for you and your subject. And again, this is all subjective. There's no right or wrong answers really when it comes to learning design, so you kinda of do the best you can with this stuff. But it's important to know about this. I will note before I move on, that there's nothing in this dimension or this um, two-dimensional view of Bloom's that has anything to do with socio-emotional. There's no um, effective knowledge or effective dimensions of knowledge here. That means the emotional stuff. There's nothing about social uh, dimensions of knowledge, nothing about cultural dimensions of, of knowledge. This is all very flat, very cognitive. Um, so just keep that in mind. One of the ways that I've had to develop my own teaching over time is really thinking about the emotional aspects of learning, how it ties into a student's prior experience, um, how that works socially, maybe how it works culturally, how we're inclusive in our learning. So just keep that in mind that this is really missing those things, but you know, you start playing 4D chess at a certain point for adding too many things into a single model. And that's one of the joys of instructional design is you just have to figure out how this stuff kind of goes together. All right, let's talk about how you would put blooms to use for you. And at the end, I'm gonna talk a little bit about AI and how that's kind of changing things a bit. So if you're writing a learning objective, there's three basic parts, the ABCs, audience, behavior, condition. Whenever you're writing a learning objective, you should be thinking about your learner, where they're at, where they need to be, how your learning experience is going to help them get there and how you're gonna measure once they're there 
that they actually did make it there. Okay, so the audience is always going to be your learner of behavior. This is the verb that you're going to use based on Bloom's taxonomy. Condition might be, you know, more detail about how they're going to perform the thing. This always depends on the time, the setting, the resources that you have at hand. There's no perfect answers. Again, very subjective. That's my theme for this talk. Everything is very subjective. So as I mentioned, audience is who's doing it. Behavior, observable performance, okay? We can't measure what's in here. We can only measure what someone's actually able to do. And the C is under what conditions do you want a learner to be able to do something? Are they going to have a cheat sheet? Are they going to have 60 seconds to summarize their answer? You don't always need to have that, but it's something to think about. It does come out to ABC. Okay, back to Blooms. Now, at each level of Blooms, there are certain verbs that roughly correspond to that level. And it also depends on how you're using the verb, what level of blooms it would pertain to, and there's an argument to be made for all sorts of different uses. Again, subjective, <laughs> okay? So if you're thinking about the bottom two levels of blooms, remembering and understanding, these are some of the verbs you might use to write objectives that pertain to the bottom two levels of that pyramid. So the basic level of blooms is remembering, people are gonna be able to define, identify, indicate, label, think again, parts of a cell, that's remembering level of blooms. Now the next level right above that understanding, they're gonna be able to differentiate, distinguish, summarize, report, slightly higher than simple memorization that comes with remembering, but still a pretty low level overall as far as um, the dimension of where, where the knowledge is actually happening in the larger taxonomy. So when you're writing learning objectives, just do a quick Google of blooms, verbs. You're gonna get huge lists of these things. The lists will vary depending on who's created them. There's no right or wrong answer to any of this. It's subjective. I will say the AI is pretty great for helping you get started writing your learning objectives. It can overcome that block of like, oh gosh, I don't even know where to, where to start with this, but don't end there. Always edit, revise. Think about where your learning objectives should fall in that taxonomy, um, maybe where they should fall on the type of knowledge, factual all the way to metacognitive, and make sure you have a really well-rounded learning experience. Now, last note, it's kind of a text-heavy slide about outcomes versus objectives. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about this, especially in relation to Blooms. Okay, there's outcomes and there's objectives. What's the difference? So again, subjective I know really helpful it kind of depends on who you're talking to how these two are differentiated and uh, what the context is so basically outcomes and objectives they're kind of the same thing but an outcome is oftentimes considered to be the higher level or the overarching objective okay this is the complete outcome so maybe you have a uh, three-day workshop and in that three-day workshop, the ultimate outcome is going to be analyze different types of authority, okay? And I've labeled this here with um, what type of knowledge and what the level of taxonomy is under Blooms. So that's the ultimate outcome for my workshop that I'm developing. Now, underneath that and aligned to it are four objectives. So the objectives are the specific things that kind of outline what learners are going to do in the workshop. And once they're done with the workshop, they'll be able to perform all of these things. But ultimately, these four things added together equal this overall outcome. So usually you have fewer outcomes, you might have a handful for a class or a higher level handful for an entire degree program. And in individual courses and individual modules of the course, for instance, you would have objectives that are all building blocks leading up. So objectives are usually going to have lower level verbs at the lower levels of blooms, but all together, they might equate to the outcome that has something pertaining to the middle level of blooms. Does that make sense? Let me know if it doesn't. So outcomes are usually big. It's so the overall outcome. Objectives are like little building blocks that get you to that outcome. Again, subjective. Depends on who you're talking to, what the context is, because that can really change a little bit. All right. Last thing here. I just want to point out, there's been a lot of thought about how AI has upended our conversations about blooms, how we approach learning experiences, how we're designing learning experiences. There's no, I don't have any answers for this. It's really difficult, honestly. 
But I thought this table was really interesting for differentiating between AI capabilities and what human skills are actually distinctive from AI. I've used AI a lot. I'm studying AI as part of my doctoral program. AI is not that smart. <laughs> I know it seems like it's really smart. It's not really that smart. AI really is kind of down here. Sometimes it has some uncanny insights that make you think it's up here. AI isn't creating, it's just regurgitating. It's statistical probability. This is dredging up a lot of stuff that seems like it should go together statistically. So think about that. Now, distinctive human skills. AI is great for the basic stuff, right? It can remember, it can understand, it can maybe draw some connections, maybe think about things we hadn't otherwise. But there's unique human skills they should be thinking about. AI is not going to create really anything new as far as like a new contribution to how we understand how people work. But humans can do that. So I've got links to all the things I showed you in this video. I've got those down below in the comments. You want to check those out. But I just want to point out that like AI seems like it thinks it doesn't think humans think humans critically think and they re reason within the various domains they use emotion ai has no emotion and we can engage in metacognitive reflection again metacognition thinking about thinking we're able to self-reflect figure out where we went wrong and do better based on that and come up with original original creations spontaneous collaboration, all of that. So just something to think about, maybe interested in checking this out and really seeing how human skills do differentiate from AI. AI is great for maybe helping us offload some of the lower level stuff, but as a human, you're still gonna have to have a mastery of that lower level stuff in order to do the higher level stuff. So as companies are reorganizing to be AI first, they're gonna be missing out on developing actual humans that can do that higher level work because they've offloaded that lower level work to AI and humans aren't getting that practice. This is a video for another day, but I hope this has been helpful for you. Let me know what you thought. I'm Lindsay and I cover instructional design, e-learning development, and all things online teaching and learning. 